Chapter Thirteen, Part Two of Industrial Biography, Ironworkers and Toolmakers by Samuel Smiles. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Clive Catterall. Joseph Clement, Part Two. The year after Mr. Clement bought out his improved turning lathe, he added to it his self-adjusting, double-driving centre chuck for which the Society of Arts awarded him their silver medal in 1828. In introducing this invention to the notice of the Society, Mr. Clement said, Although I have been in the habit of turning, and making turning lathes and other machinery for upwards of thirty-five years, and have examined the best turning lathes in the principal manufactories throughout Great Britain, I find it universally regretted by all practical men that they cannot turn anything perfectly true between the centres of the lathe. It was found, by experience, that there was a degree of eccentricity, and consequently of imperfection, in the figure of any long cylinder turned while suspended between the centres of the lathe, and made to revolve by the action of a single driver. Under such circumstances the pressure of the tool tended to force the work out of the right line, and to distribute the strain between the driver and the adjacent centre, so that one end of the cylinder became eccentric with respect to the other. By Mr. Clement's invention of the two-armed driver, which was self-adjusting, the strain was taken from the centre and divided between the two arms, which being equidistant from the centre, effectually corrected all eccentricity in the work. This invention was found of great importance in ensuring the true turning of large machinery, which before had been found a matter of considerable difficulty. In the same year, 1828, Mr. Clement began the making of fluted taps and dies, and he established a mechanical practice with reference to the pitch of the screw, which proved of the greatest importance in the economics of manufacture. Before his time, each mechanical engineer adopted a thread of his own, so that when a piece of work came under repair, the screw hob had usually to be drilled out, and a new thread was introduced, according to the usage which prevailed in the shop in which the work was executed. Mr. Clement saw a great waste of labour in this practice, and he promulgated the idea that every screw of a particular length ought to be furnished with its appointed number of threads of a settled pitch. Taking the inch as the basis of his calculations, he determined the number of threads in each case, and the practice thus initiated by him, recommended as it was by convenience and economy, was very shortly adopted throughout the trade. It may be mentioned that one of Clement's ablest journeymen, Mr. Whitworth, has since his time been mainly instrumental in establishing the settled practice, and Whitworth's thread, initiated by Clement, has become recognised throughout the mechanical world. To carry out his idea, Clement invented his screw-engine lathe, with gearing, mandrel, and sliding table wheelwork, by means of which he first cut the inside screw tools from the left-handed hobs, the reverse mode having before been adopted. While in shaping machines he was the first to use the revolving cutter attached to the slide rest. Then, in 1828, he fluted the taps for the first time with a revolving cutter, other makers having up to that time only notched them. Among his other inventions in screws may be mentioned his headless tap, which, according to Mr. Naismith, is so valuable an invention that, if he had done nothing else, it ought to immortalise him among mechanics. It passed right through the hole to be tapped, and was thus enabled to do the duty of three ordinary screws. By these improvements much greater precision was secured in the manufacture of tools and machinery, accompanied by a greatly reduced cost of production, the results of which are felt to this day. Another of Mr. Clement's ingenious inventions was his planing machine, by means of which metal plates of large dimensions were planed with perfect truth, and finished with beautiful accuracy. There is, perhaps, scarcely a machine about which there has been more controversy than this, and we do not pretend to be able to determine the respective merits of the many able mechanics who have had a hand in its invention. It is exceedingly probable that others beside Clement worked out the problem in their own way by independent methods, and this is confirmed by the circumstance that, though the results achieved by the respective inventors were the same, 
the methods employed by them were in many respects different. As regards Clement, we find that previous to the year 1820 he had a machine in regular use for planing the triangular bars of lathes and the sides of weaving looms. This instrument was found so useful and so economical in its working that Clement proceeded to elaborate a planing machine of a more complete kind, which he finished and set to work in the year 1825. He prepared no model of it, but made it directly from the working drawings, and it was so nicely constructed that when put together it went without a hitch, and has continued steadily working for more than thirty years down to the present day. Clement took out no patent for his invention, relying for protection mainly on his own and his workman's skill in using it. We therefore find no specification of his machine at the patent office, as in the case of most other capital inventions. But a very complete account of it is to be found in the Transactions of the Society of Arts for 1832, as described by Mr. Varley. The practical value of the planing machine induced the Society to apply to Mr. Clement for liberty to publish a full description of it, and Mr. Varley's paper was the result. It may be briefly stated that this engineer's plane differs greatly from the carpenter's plane, the cutter of which is only allowed to project so far as to admit of a thin shaving to be sliced off, the plane working flat in proportion to the width of the tool, and its length and straightness preventing the cutter from descending in any hollows in the wood. The engineer's plane more resembles the turning lathe, of which, indeed, it is but a modification, working up on the same principle on flat surfaces. The tools or cutters in Clement's machine were similar to those used in the lathe, varying in like manner, but performing their work in right lines, the tool being stationary and the work moving under it, the tool only travelling when making lateral cuts. To save time, two cutters were mounted, one to cut while the work going, and the other while returning, both being so arranged and held as to be presented to the work in the firmest manner with the least possible friction. The bed of the machine on which the work was laid passed under the cutters on perfectly true rollers or wheels, lodged and held in their bearings as accurately as the best mandrel could be, and having set screws acting against their ends totally preventing all end motion. The machine was bedded on a massive and solid foundation of masonry in heavy blocks, the support at all points being so complete as effectually to destroy all tendency to vibration, with the object of securing full, round, and quiet cuts. The rollers on which the planing machine travelled were so true that Clement himself used to say of them, if you were to put a paper shaving under one of the rollers, it would at once stop all the rest. Nor was this any exaggeration, the entire mechanism, notwithstanding its great size, being as true and as accurate as that of a watch. By an ingenious adaption of the apparatus, which will also be found described in the Society of Arts paper, the planing machine might be fitted with a lathe bed, either to hold two centres or a head with a suitable mandrel. When so fitted, the machine was enabled to do the work of a turning lathe, though in a different way, cutting cylinders or cones in their longitudinal direction perfectly straight, as well as solids or prisms of any angle, either by the longitudinal or lateral motion of the cutter. Whilst by making the work revolve, it might be turned as in any other lathe. This ingenious machine, as contrived by Mr. Clement, therefore represented a complete union of the turning lathe with the planing machine and dividing engine, by which turning of the most complicated kind might readily be executed. For ten years after it was set in motion, Clement's was the only machine of the sort available for planing large work, and being consequently very much in request, it was often kept going night and day, the earnings by the planing machine alone during that time forming the principal income of its inventor. As it took in a piece of work six feet square, and by his charge for planing was three halfpence the square inch, or eighteen shillings the square foot, he could thus earn by his machine alone some ten pounds for every day's work of twelve hours. We may add that since planing machines in various forms have become common in mechanical workshops, 
the cost of planing does not amount to more than three halfpence the square foot. The excellence of Mr. Clement's tools, and his well-known skill in designing and executing work requiring unusual accuracy and finish, led to his being employed by Mr. Babbage to make his celebrated calculating or difference engine. The contrivance of a machine that should work out complicated sums in arithmetic with perfect precision was, as may be readily imagined, one of the most difficult feats of the mechanical intellect. To do this was in an especial sense to stamp matter with the impress of mind, and render it subservient to the highest thinking faculty. Attempts had been made at an early period to perform arithmetical calculations by mechanical aids more rapidly and precisely than it was possible to do by the operations of the individual mind. The preparation of arithmetical tables of high numbers involved a vast deal of labour, and even with the greatest care errors were unavoidable and numerous. Thus, in a multiplication table prepared by a man so eminent as Dr. Hutton for the Board of Longitude, no fewer than forty errors were discovered in a single page taken at random. In the tables of the nautical almanac, where the greatest possible precision was desirable and necessary, more than five hundred errors were detected by one person, and the tables of the Board of Longitude were found equally incorrect. But such errors were impossible to be avoided so long as the ordinary modes of calculating, transcribing, and printing continued in use. The earliest and simplest form of calculating apparatus was that employed by the schoolboys of ancient Greece, called the abacus, consisting of a smooth board with a narrow rim, on which they were taught to compute by means of progressive rows of pebbles, bits of bone or ivory, or pieces of silver coin used as counters. The same board, strewn over with sand, was used for teaching the rudiments of writing and the principles of geometry. The Romans subsequently adopted the abacus, dividing it by means of perpendicular lines or bars, and from the description of calculus, which they gave to each pebble or counter employed on the board, we have derived our English word to calculate. The same instrument continued to be employed during the Middle Ages, and the table used by the English court of exchequer was but a modified form of the Greek abacus, the chequered lines across it giving the designation to the court, which still survives. Tallies, from the French word taille, to cut, were another of the mechanical methods employed to record computations, though in a very rude way. Step by step, improvements were made, the most important being that invented by Napier of Merchiston, the inventor of logarithms commonly called Napier's Bones, consisting of a number of rods divided into ten equal squares and numbered, so that the whole, when placed together, formed the common multiplication table. By these means various operations in multiplication and division were performed. Sir Samuel Morland, Gunter, and Lamb introduced other contrivances applicable to trigonometry, Gunter's scale being still in common use. The calculating machines of Gersten and Pascal were of a different kind, working out arithmetical calculations by means of trains of wheels and other arrangements, and that contrived by Lord Stanhope for the purpose of verifying his calculations with respect to the national debt was of like character. But none of these will bear for a moment to be compared with a machine designed by Mr. Babbage for performing arithmetical calculations and mathematical analyses, as well as for recording the calculations when made, thereby getting rid entirely of individual error in the operations of calculation, transcription, and printing. The French government, in their desire to promote the extension of the decimal system, had ordered the construction of logarithmical tables of vast extent, but the great labour and expense involved in the undertaking prevented the design from being carried out. It was reserved for Mr. Babbage to develop the idea by means of a machine which he called the Difference Engine. This machine is of so complicated a character that it would be impossible for us to give any intelligible description of it in words. Although Dr. Lardner was unrivalled in the art of describing mechanism, he occupied twenty-five pages of the Edinburgh Review, volume 59, in endeavouring to describe its action, and there were several features in it which he gave up as hopeless. Some parts of the apparatus and modes of action are indeed extraordinary. 
and perhaps none more so than that for ensuring accuracy in the calculated results, the machine actually correcting itself, and rubbing itself back into accuracy when the disposition to err occurs by the friction of adjacent machinery. When an error is made, the wheels become locked and refuse to proceed. Thus the machine must go rightly or not at all. An arrangement as nearly resembling volition as anything that brass and steel are likely to accomplish. This intricate subject was taken up by Mr. Babbage in 1821, when he undertook to superintend for the British government the construction of a machine for calculating and printing mathematical and astronomical tables. The model first constructed to illustrate the nature of his invention produced figures at the rate of forty-four a minute. In 1832 the Royal Society was requested to report upon the invention, and after full inquiry the committee recommended it as one deserving of public encouragement. A sum of £1,500 was then placed at Mr. Babbage's disposal by the Lords of the Treasury for the purposes of enabling him to perfect his invention. It was at this time that he engaged Mr. Clement as draughtsman and mechanic to embody his ideas in a working machine. Numerous tools were expressly contrived by the latter for executing the several parts, and workmen were specially educated for the purpose of using them. Some idea of the elaborate character of the drawings may be formed from the fact that those required for the calculating machinery alone, not to mention the printing machinery which was almost equally elaborate, covered not less than four hundred square feet of surface. The cost of executing the calculating machine was of course very great, and the progress of the work was necessarily slow. The consequence was that the government first became impatient, and then began to grumble at the expense. At the end of seven years the engineer's bills alone were found to amount to nearly £7,200, and Mr. Babbage's costs out of pocket to 7,000 more. In order to make more satisfactory progress, it was determined to remove the works to the neighbourhood of Mr. Babbage's own residence. But as Clement's claims for conducting the operations in the new premises were thought exorbitant, and as he himself considered that the work did not yield him the average profit of ordinary employment in his own trade, he eventually withdrew from the enterprise, taking with him the tools which he had constructed for executing the machine. The government also shortly after withdrew from it, and from that time the scheme was suspended, the calculating engine remaining a beautiful but unfinished fragment of a great work. Though originally intended to go as far as twenty figures, it was only completed to the extent of being capable of calculating to the depth of five figures, and two orders of difference, and only a small part of the proposed printing machinery was ever made. The engine was placed in the Museum of King's College in 1843, enclosed in a glass case, until the year 1862, when it was removed for a time to the Great Exhibition, where it formed perhaps the most remarkable and beautifully executed piece of mechanism, the combined result of intellectual and mechanical contrivance, in the entire collection. Clement was on various other occasions invited to undertake work requiring extra skill, which other mechanics were unwilling or unable to execute. He was thus always full of employment, never being under the necessity of canvassing for customers. He was almost constantly in his workshop, in which he took great pride. His dwelling was over the office in the yard, and it was with difficulty he could be induced to leave the premises. On one occasion Mr. Brunel of the Great Western Railway called upon him to ask if he could supply him with a superior steam whistle for his locomotives, the whistles which they were using giving forth very little sound. Clement examined the specimen brought by Brunel, and pronounced it to be mere tallow-chandler's work. He undertook to supply the proper article, and after his usual fashion he proceeded to contrive a machine or tool for the express purpose of making steam whistles. They were made and supplied, and when mounted on the locomotive the effect was indeed screaming. They were heard miles off, and Brunel, delighted, ordered a hundred. But when the bill came in, it was found that the charge made for them was very high, as much as forty pounds the set, 
the company demurred at the price, Brunel declaring it to be six times more than the price they had before been paying. "'That may be,' rejoined Clement, "'but mine are more than six times better. You ordered a first-rate article, and you must be content to pay for it.' The matter was referred to an arbitrator who awarded the full sum claimed. Mr. Weld mentions a similar case of an order which Clement received from America to make a large screw of given dimensions, in the best possible manner, and he accordingly proceeded to make one with the greatest mathematical accuracy. But his bill amounted to some hundreds of pounds, which completely staggered the American, who did not calculate on having to pay more than twenty pounds at the utmost for the screw. The matter was, however, referred to arbitrators, who gave the decision, as in the former case, in favour of the mechanic. One of the last works which Clement executed as a matter of pleasure was the building of an organ for his own use. It will be remembered that when working as a slater at Great Ashby he had made flutes and clarinets, and now in his old age he determined to try his skill at making an organ, in his opinion the king of musical instruments. The building of it became his hobby, and his greatest delight was in superintending its progress. It cost him about two thousand pounds in labour alone, but he lived to finish it, and we have been informed that it was pronounced a very excellent instrument. Clement was a heavy-browed man, without any polish of manner or speech. For to the last he continued to use his strong Westmoreland dialect. He was not educated in a literary sense, for he had read but little, and could write with difficulty. He was eminently a mechanic, and had achieved his exquisite skill by observation, experience, and reflection. His head was a complete repertory of inventions, on which he was constantly drawing for the improvement of mechanical practice. Though he had never more than thirty workmen in his factory, they were all of the first class and the example which Clement set before them of extreme carefulness and accuracy in execution rendered his shop one of the best schools of its time for the training of thoroughly accomplished mechanics. Mr. Clement died in 1844, in his sixty-fifth year, after which his works were carried on by Mr. Wilkinson, one of his nephews, and his planing machine still continues in useful work. End of chapter 13。chapter 14 of industrial biography。iron workers and tool makers by Samuel Smiles。this librivox recording is in the public domain。recording by Clive Catterall。fox of derby。murray of leeds。roberts and whitworth of manchester。Founders and senators of states and cities, lawgivers, extirpers or tyrants, fathers of the people, and other eminent persons in civil government, were honoured, but with titles of worthies or demigods, whereas such as were inventors and authors of new arts, endowments, and commodities towards man's life, were ever consecrated amongst the gods themselves. Bacon. Advancement of Learning. While such were the advances made in the arts of tool-making and engine construction through the labours of Brahma, Maudsley, and Clement, there were other mechanics of almost equal eminence who flourished about the same time and subsequently in several of the northern manufacturing towns. Among these may be mentioned James Fox of Derby, Matthew Murray and Peter Fairbairn of Leeds, Richard Roberts, Joseph Whitworth, James Naismith, and William Fairbairn of Manchester, to all of whom the manufacturing industry of Great Britain stands in the highest degree indebted. James Fox, the founder of the Derby firm of mechanical engineers, was originally a butler in the service of Rev. Thomas Gisborne of Foxhall Lodge, Staffordshire. Though a situation of this kind might not seem by any means favourable for the display of mechanical ability, yet the butler's instinct for handicraft was so strong that it could not be repressed and his master not only encouraged him in the handling of tools in his leisure hours, but had so genuine an admiration of his skill, as well as his excellent qualities of character, that he eventually furnished him with the means of beginning business on his own account, 
The growth and extension of the cotton, silk, and lace trades in the neighbourhood of Derby furnished Fox with sufficient opportunities for the exercise of his mechanical skills, and he soon found ample scope for its employment. His lace machinery became celebrated, and he supplied it largely to the neighbouring town of Nottingham. He also obtained considerable employment from the great firms of Arkwright and Strutt, the founders of the modern cotton manufacture. Mr. Fox also became celebrated for his lathes, which were of excellent quality, still maintaining their high reputation. And besides making largely for the supply of the home demand, he exported much machinery abroad to France, Russia, and the Mauritius. The present Messrs. Fox of Derby, who continue to carry on the business of the firm, claim for their grandfather, its founder, that he made the first planing machine in 1814, and they add that the original article continued in use until quite recently. We have been furnished by Samuel Hall, formerly a workman at the Messrs. Fox's, with the following description of the machine. It was essentially the same in principle as the planing machine now in general use, although differing in detail. It had a self-acting ratchet motion for moving the slide of a compound slide rest, and a self-acting reversing tackle, consisting of three bevel wheels, one a stud, one loose on the driving shaft, and another on a socket, with a pinion on the opposite end of the driving shaft running on the socket. The other end was the place for the driving pulley. A clutch box was placed between the two opposite wheels, which was made to slide on a feather, so that by means of another shaft containing levers and a tumbling ball, the box, on reversing, was carried from one bevelled wheel to the opposite one. The same James Fox is also said, at a very early period, to have invented a screw-cutting machine, an engine for accurately dividing and cutting teeth of wheels, and a self-acting lathe. But the evidence as to the dates at which these several inventions are said to have been made is so conflicting that it is impossible to decide with whom the merit of making them really exists. The same idea is found floating at the same time in many minds, the like necessity pressing upon all, and the process of invention takes place in like manner. Hence the contemporaneousness of so many inventions and the disputes that arise respecting them, as described in the previous chapter. There are still other claimants for the merit of having invented the planing machine, among whom may be mentioned more particularly Matthew Murray of Leeds and Richard Roberts of Manchester. We are informed by Mr. March, the present Mayor of Leeds, head of the celebrated tool manufacturing firm of that town, that when he first went to work at Matthew Murray's in 1814, a planing machine of his invention was used to plane the circular part or back of the D-valve, which he had by that time introduced in the steam engine. Mr. March says, I recollect it very distinctly, and even the sort of framing on which it stood. The machine was not patented, and like many inventions in those days, it was kept as much a secret as possible, being locked up in a small room by itself, to which the ordinary workman could not obtain access. The year in which I remember it being in use was, so far as I am aware, long before any planing machine of a similar kind had been invented. Matthew Murray was born at Stockton-on-Tees in the year 1763. His parents were of the working class, and Matthew, like the other members of his family, was brought up with the ordinary career of labourer before him. When of due age his father apprenticed him to the trade of a blacksmith in which he very soon acquired considerable expertness. He married before his term had expired, after which, trade being slack at Stockton, he found it necessary to look for work elsewhere. Leaving his wife behind him, he set out for Leeds with his bundle on his back, and, after a long journey on foot, he reached that town with not enough money left in his pocket to pay for a bed at the Bay Horse Inn where he had put up. But telling the landlord that he expected work at Marshall's, and seeming to be a respectable young man, the landlord trusted him, and he was so fortunate as to obtain the job which he sought at Mr. Marshall's, who was then beginning the manufacture of flax, for which the firm has since become so famous. Mr. Marshall was at that time engaged in improving the method of manufacture, and the young blacksmith was so fortunate 
or rather so dexterous, as to be able to suggest several improvements in the machinery which secured the approval of his employer, who made him a present of twenty pounds, and very shortly promoted him to be the first mechanic in the workshop. On this stroke of good fortune, Murray took a house in the neighbouring village of Beeston, sent to Stockton for his wife, who speedily joined him, and he now felt himself fairly started in the world. He remained with Mr. Marshall for about twelve years, during which he introduced numerous improvements in the machinery for spinning flax, and obtained the reputation for being a first-rate mechanic. This induced Mr. James Fenton and Mr. David Wood to offer to join him in the establishment of an engineering and machine-making factory at Leeds, which he agreed to, and operations were commenced at Holbeck in the year 1795. As Mr. Murray had obtained considerable practical knowledge of the steam engine while working at Mr. Marshall's, he took principal charge of the engine building department, while his partner, Wood, directed the machine making. In the branch of engine building, Mr. Murray very shortly established a high reputation, treading close upon the heels of Bolton and Watt, so close indeed that the firm became very jealous of him, and purchased a large piece of ground close to his works with the object of preventing their extension. His additions to the steam engine were of great practical value, one of which, the self-acting apparatus attached to the boiler for the purpose of regulating the intensity of the fire under it, and consequently of the production of steam, is still in general use. This was invented by him as early as 1799. He also subsequently invented the D-slide valve, or at least greatly improved it, while he added to the power of the air pump and gave a new arrangement to the other parts with a view to the simplification of the powers of the engine. To make the D-valve work efficiently, it was found necessary to form two perfectly plane surfaces, to produce which he invented his planing machine. He was also the first to adopt the practice of placing the piston in a horizontal position in the common condensing engine. Among his other modifications to the steam engine was his improvement of the locomotive, as invented by Trevithick and it ought to be remembered to his honour that he made the first locomotive that regularly worked upon any railway. This was the engine erected by him for Blenkinsop, to work the Middleton Colliery Railway near Leeds, on which it began to run in 1812, and continued in regular use for many years. In this engine he introduced the double cylinder, Trevithick's engine being provided with only one cylinder, the defects of which were supplemented by the addition of a flywheel to carry the crank over the dead points. But Matthew Murray's most important inventions, considered in their effects on manufacturing industry, were those connected with the machinery for heckling and spinning flax, which he greatly improved. His heckling machine obtained for him the prize of the gold medal of the Society of Arts, and this, as well as his machine for wet flax spinning by means of sponge weights, proved to the greatest practical value. At the time when these inventions were made, the flax trade was on the point of expiring, the spinners being unable to produce yarn to a profit, and their almost immediate effect was to reduce the cost of production, to improve immensely the quality of the manufacture, and to establish the British linen trade on a solid foundation. The production of flax machinery became an important branch of manufacture at Leeds, large quantities being made for home use as well as for exportation, giving employment to an increasing number of highly skilled mechanics. Mr. Murray's faculty for organising work, perfected by experience, enabled him also to introduce many valuable improvements in the mechanics of manufacturing. His preeminent skill in mill-gearing became generally acknowledged, and the effects of his labours are felt to this day in the extensive and still thriving branches of industry, which his ingenuity and ability mainly contributed to establish. All the machine tools used in his establishment were designed by himself, and he was most careful in the personal superintendence of all the details of their construction. Mr. Murray died at Leeds in 1826, in his sixty-third year. We have not yet exhausted the list of claimants to the invention of the planing machine, for we find still another in the person of Richard Roberts of Manchester, one of the most prolific of modern inventors, 
Mr. Roberts has indeed achieved so many undisputed inventions that he can readily afford to divide the honour of this case with others. He has contrived things so various as the self-acting mule and the best electromagnet, wet gas meters and dry planing machines, iron billiard tables and turret clocks, the centrifugal railway and the drill slotting machine, an apparatus for making cigars and machinery for the propulsion and equipment of steamships, so that he may almost be regarded as the admirable Crichton of modern mechanics. Richard Roberts was born in 1789 at Karikofa in the parish of Hlanimanech. His father was by trade a shoemaker, to which he occasionally added the occupation of toll-keeper. The house in which Richard was born stood upon the border-line which then divided the counties of Salop and Montgomery, the front door opening into the one county, and the back door into the other. Richard, when a boy, received next to no education, and as soon as he was of fitting age was put to common labouring work. For some time he worked in a quarry near his father's dwelling, but being of an ingenious turn, he occupied his leisure hours in making various articles of mechanism, partly for amusement and partly for profit. One of his first achievements, while working as a quarryman, was a spinning-wheel, of which he was very proud, for it was considered a good job. Thus he gradually acquired dexterity in handling tools, and he shortly came to entertain the ambition of becoming a mechanic. There were several ironworks in the neighbourhood, and thither he went in search of employment. He succeeded in finding work as a pattern-maker at Bradley, near Bilston, under John Wilkinson, the famous ironmaster, a man of great enterprise as well as mechanical skill, for he was the first man, as already stated, that Watt could find capable of boring a cylinder with any approach to truth for the purpose of his steam-engines. After acquiring some practical knowledge of the art of working in wood as well as iron, Roberts proceeded to Birmingham, where he passed through several different shops, gaining further experience in mechanical practice. He tried his hand at many kinds of work, and acquired considerable dexterity in each. He was regarded as a sort of jack-of-all-trades, for he was a good turner, a tolerable wheelwright, and could repair mill-work at a pinch. He next moved northward to the Horsley Ironworks, Tipton, where he was working as a pattern-maker when he had the misfortune to be drawn in his own county for the militia. He immediately left his work, and made his way homeward to Llanymanach, determined not to be a soldier or even a militiaman. But home was not the place for him to rest in, and after bidding a hasty adieu to his father, he crossed the county northward on foot to reach Liverpool, in the hopes of finding work there. Failing in that, he set out for Manchester, and reached it at dusk, very weary and very miry in consequence of the road being in such a wretched state of mud and ruts. He relates that, not knowing a person in the town, he went up to an apple stall, ostensibly to buy a pennyworth of apples, but really to ask the stall-keeper if he knew of any person in want of a hand. Was there any turner in the neighbourhood? Yes, round the corner. Thither he went at once, found the wood-turner in, and was promised a job on the following morning. He remained with the turner for only a short time, after which he found a job in Salford at lathe and tool-making. But hearing that the militia warrant officers were still searching for him, he became uneasy, and determined to take refuge in London. He trudged all the way on foot to that great hiding-place, and first tried Holtzapfels, the famous tool-makers, but failing in his application he next went to Maudsley's, and succeeded in getting employment. He worked there for some time, acquiring much valuable practical knowledge in the use of tools, cultivating his skill by contact with first-class workmen, and benefiting from the spirit of active contrivance which pervaded the Maudsley shops. His manual dexterity greatly increased, and his inventive ingenuity fully stimulated, he determined on making his way back to Manchester which, even more than London itself, at that time presented abundant openings for men of mechanical skill. Hence we find so many of the best mechanics trained at Maudsley and Clements, Naismith, Lewis, Muir, Roberts, Whitworth and others, 
shortly rising into distinction there as leading mechanics and toolmakers. The mere enumeration of the various results of Mr. Robert's inventive skill during the period of his settlement at Manchester as a mechanical engineer would occupy more space than we can well spare. But we may briefly mention a few of the more important. In 1816, while carrying on business on his own account at Deansgate, he invented his improved sector for correctly sizing wheels in blank previously to their being cut, which is still extensively used. In the same year he invented his improved screw lathe, and in the following year, at the request of the Borough Reeve and Constables of Manchester, he contrived an oscillating and rotating wet gas meter of a new kind, which enabled them to sell gas by measure. This was the first meter in which a water lute was applied to prevent the escape of gas by the index shaft, the want of which, as well as its great complexity, had prevented the only other gas meter then in existence from working satisfactorily. The water lute was immediately adopted by the patentee of that meter. The planing machine, though claimed as we have seen by many inventors, was constructed by Mr. Roberts after an original plan of his own in 1817, and became the tool most generally employed in mechanical workshops, acting by means of a chain and rack, though it has since been superseded to some extent by the planing machine of Whitworth, which works both ways upon an endless screw. Improvements followed in the slide lathe, giving a large range of speed with increased diameters for the same size of headstock, etc., in the wheel-cutting engine, in the scale beam, by which, with a load of two ounces on each end, the fifteen-hundredth part of a grain could be indicated, in the broaching machine, the slotting machine, and other engines. But the inventions by which his fame became most extensively known arose out of circumstances connected with the cotton manufacture of Manchester and the neighbourhood. The great improvements which he introduced in the machine for making weavers' reeds led to the formation of the firm of Sharp, Roberts & Company, of which Mr. Roberts was the acting mechanical partner for many years. Not less important were his improvements in power looms for weaving fustians, which were extensively adopted. But by far the most famous of his inventions was unquestionably his self-acting mule, one of the most elaborate and beautiful pieces of machinery ever contrived. Before its invention, the working of the entire machinery of the cotton mill, as well as the employment of its piecers, cleaners, and other classes of operatives, depended upon the spinners, who, though receiving the highest rates of pay, were by much the most given to strikes and they were frequently accustomed to turn out in times when trade was brisk, thereby bringing the whole operations of the manufactories to a standstill, and throwing all the other operatives out of employment. A long-continued strike of this sort took place in 1824, when the idea occurred to the masters that it might be possible to make the spinning mules run out and in at the proper speed by means of self-acting machinery, and thus render them in some measure independent of the more refractory class of their workmen. It seemed, however, to be so very difficult a problem that they were by no means sanguine of success in its solution. Some time passed before they could find any mechanic willing to so much as consider the subject. Mr. Ashton of Staley Bridge made every effort in this object, but the answer he got was uniformly the same. The thing was declared to be impracticable and impossible. Mr. Ashton, accompanied by two other leading spinners, called upon Sharp, Roberts & Company to seek an interview with Mr. Roberts. They introduced the subject to him, but he would scarcely listen to their explanations, cutting them short with the remark that he knew nothing whatever about cotton spinning. They insisted, nevertheless, on explaining to him what they required, but they went away without being able to obtain from him any promise of assistance in bringing out the required machine. The strike continued and the manufacturers again called upon Mr. Roberts, but with no better result. A third time they called and applied to Mr. Sharp, the capitalist of the firm, who promised to use his best endeavours to induce his mechanical partner to take the matter in hand. But Mr. Roberts, notwithstanding his reticence, had been occupied in carefully pondering the subject since Mr. Ashton's first interview with him. The very difficulty of the problem to be solved had tempted him boldly to grapple with it. 
though he would not hold out the slightest expectation to the cotton spinners of his being able to help them in their emergency until he saw his way perfectly clear. That time had now come, and when Mr. Sharp introduced the subject, he said he had turned the matter over and thought he could construct the required self-acting machinery. It was arranged that he should proceed with it at once, and after a close study of four months he brought out the machine now so extensively known as the self-acting mule. The invention was patented in 1825, and was perfected by subsequent additions, which were also patented. Like so many other inventions, the idea of the self-acting mule was not new. Thus Mr. William Strutt of Derby, the father of Lord Belper, invented a machine of this sort at an early period. Mr. William Belly, of the New Lanark Mills, invented a second, and various other projectors tried their skill in the same direction, but none of these inventions came into practical use. In such cases it has become generally admitted that the real inventor is not the person who suggests the idea of the invention, but he who first works it out into a practicable process, and so makes it of practical and commercial value. This was accomplished by Mr. Roberts, who, working out the idea after his own independent methods, succeeded in making the first self-acting mule that would really act as such, and he is therefore fairly entitled to be regarded as its inventor. By means of this beautiful contrivance, spindle carriages, bearing hundreds of spindles, run themselves out and in by means of automatic machinery at the proper speed without a hand touching them, the only labour required being that of a few boys and girls to watch them and mend the broken threads when the carriage recedes from the roller beam, and to stop it when the cop is completely formed, as is indicated by the bell of the counter attached to the working gear. Mr. Baines describes the self-acting mule while at work as drawing out, twisting and winding up many thousand threads with unfailing precision and indefatigable patience and strength a scene as magical to the eye which is not familiarised with it as the effects have been marvellous in augmenting the wealth and population of the country. Mr. Roberts' great success with the self-acting mule led to his being often appealed to for help in the mechanics of manufacturing. In 1826, the year after his patent was taken out, he was sent for to Mulhouse in Alsace to design and arrange the machine establishment of André Cochlin and Company and in that, and the two subsequent years, he fairly set the works a-going, instructing the workmen in the manufacture of spinning machinery, and thus contributing largely to the success of the French cotton manufacture. In 1832 he patented his invention of the radial arm for winding on at the self-acting mule, now in general use, and in future years he took out sundry patents for roving, slubbing, spinning, and doubling cotton and other fibrous materials and for weaving, beetling, and mangling fabrics of various sorts. A considerable branch of business carried out by the firm of Sharp, Roberts & Company was the manufacture of iron billiard-tables, which were constructed with almost perfect truth by means of Mr. Roberts' planing machine, and became a large article of export. But a much more important and remunerative department was the manufacture of locomotives, which was begun by the firm shortly after the opening of the Liverpool and Manchester Railway had marked this as one of the chief branches of future mechanical engineering. Mr. Roberts adroitly seized the opportunity presented by this new field of invention and enterprise, and devoted himself for a time to the careful study of the locomotive and its powers. As early as the year 1829 we find him presenting to the Manchester Mechanics Institute a machine exhibiting the nature of friction upon railroads in solution of the problem then under discussion in the scientific journals. In the following year he patented an arrangement for communicating power to both driving wheels of the locomotive, at all times in the exact proportions required when turning to the left or right, an arrangement which has since been adopted in many road locomotives and agricultural engines. In the same patent will be found embodied his invention of the steam brake, which was also a favourite idea of George Stevenson since elaborated by Mr. McConnell of the London and North Western Railway. In 1834, Sharp, Roberts and Company began the manufacture of locomotives on a large scale, and the compactness of their engines 
the excellence of their workmanship, and the numerous original improvements introduced in them, speedily secured for the engines of the Atlas firm a high reputation and a very large demand. Among Mr. Roberts' improvements may be mentioned his method of manufacturing the crank axle, of welding the rim and tyres of the wheels, and his arrangement and form of the wrought-iron framing of the axle guards. His system of templates and gauges, by means of which every part of an engine or tender corresponded with that of every other engine or tender of the same class, was as great an improvement as Maudsley's system of uniformity of parts in other descriptions of machinery. In connection with the subject of railways, we may allude in passing to Mr. Roberts' invention of the Jacquard punching machine, a self-acting tool of great power, used for punching any required number of holes of any pitch into any pattern with mathematical accuracy in bridge or boiler plates. The origin of this invention was somewhat similar to that of the self-acting mule. The contractors for the Conway Tubular Bridge, while under construction in 1848, were greatly hampered by combinations among the workmen, and they despaired of being able to finish the girders within the time specified in the contract. The punching of the iron plates by hand was a tedious and expensive as well as inaccurate process, and the work was proceeding so slowly that the contractors found it absolutely necessary to adopt some new method of punching if they were to finish the work on time. In their emergency they appealed to Mr. Roberts, and endeavoured to persuade him to take the matter up. He at length consented to do so, and evolved the machine in question during his evening's leisure, for the most part while quietly sipping his tea. The machine was produced, the contractors were enabled to proceed with the punching of the plates, independent of the refractory men, and the work was executed with a dispatch, accuracy and excellence that would not otherwise have been possible. Only a few years since, Mr. Roberts added a useful companion to the Jacquard punching machine, in his combined self-acting machine for shearing iron and punching both webs of angle or T-iron simultaneously to any required pitch. Though this machine, like others which have proceeded from his fertile brain, is ahead even of this fast manufacturing age, and has not yet come into general use, but is certain to do so before many years have elapsed. These inventions were surely enough for one man to have accomplished, but we have not yet done. The mere enumeration of his other inventions would occupy several pages. We shall merely allude to a few of them. One was his turret clock, for which he obtained the medal at the Great Exhibition of 1851. Another was his prize electromagnet of 1845. When this subject was first mentioned to him, he said he did not know anything of the theory or practice of electromagnetism, but he would try and find out. The result of his trying was that he won the prize for the most powerful electromagnet. One is placed in the museum at Peel Park, Manchester, and another with the Scottish Society of Arts, Edinburgh. In 1846 he perfected an American invention for making cigars by machinery, enabling a boy, working one of his cigar engines, to make as many as five thousand in a day. In 1852 he patented improvements in the construction, propelling and equipment of steamships, which have, we believe, been adopted to a certain extent by the Admiralty. And a few years later, in 1855, we find him presenting the Secretary of War with plans of elongated rifle projectiles to be used in smoothbore ordnance, with a view to utilise the old pattern gun. His head, like so many inventors of the time, being full of the mechanics of war, he went so far as to wait upon Louis Napoleon and lay before him a plan by which Sebastopol was to be blown down. In short, upon whatever subject he turned his mind, he left the impress of his inventive faculty. If it was imperfect, he improved it. If incapable of improvement and impracticable, he invented something entirely new, superseding it altogether. But with all his inventive genius, in the exercise of which Mr. Roberts has so largely added to the productive power of the country, we regret to say that he is not gifted with a commercial faculty. He has helped others in their difficulties, but forgotten himself. Many have profited by his inventions without even acknowledging the obligations which they owed to him. They have used his brains and copied his tools, and the sucked orange is all but forgotten. 
There may have been a want of worldly wisdom on his part, but it is lamentable to think that one of the most prolific and useful inventors of his time should, in his old age, be left to fight with poverty. Mr. Whitworth is another of the first-class toolmakers of Manchester, who has turned to excellent account his training in the workshops of Maudsley and Clement. He has carried fully out the system of uniformity in screw-threads which they initiated, and he has still further improved the mechanism of the planing machine, enabling it to work both backwards and forwards by means of a screw and roller motion. His Jim Crow machine, so called from its peculiar motion in reversing itself and working both ways, is an extremely beautiful tool, adapted alike for horizontal, vertical or angular motions. The minute accuracy of Mr. Whitworth's machines is not the least of their merits, and nothing will satisfy him short of perfect truth. At the meeting of the Institute of Mechanical Engineers at Glasgow in 1856, he read a paper on the essential importance of possessing a true plane as a standard of reference in mechanical constructions, and he described elaborately the true method of securing it, namely by scraping instead of by the ordinary process of grinding. At the same meeting he exhibited a machine of his own invention, by which he stated that a difference of a millionth part of an inch in length could at once be detected. He also there urged his favourite idea of uniformity and proper gradation of size of parts in all the various branches of the mechanical arts, as a chief means towards economy of production, a principle, as he showed, capable of very extensive application. To show the progress of tools and machinery in his own time, Mr. Whitworth cited the fact that, thirty years since, the cost of labour for making a surface of cast iron true, one of the most important operations in mechanics, by chipping and filing by the hand, was twelve shillings a square foot, whereas it is now done by the planing machine at a cost of labour of less than a penny. Then in machinery, pieces of seventy-four reed printing cotton cloth of twenty-nine yards each could not be produced at less cost than thirty shillings sixpence per piece, whereas the same description is now sold for three shillings and ninepence. Mr. Whitworth has been among the most effective workers in this field of improvement, his tools taking the first place in point of speed, accuracy and finish of work, in which respect they challenge competition with the world. Mr. Whitworth has of late years been applying himself with his accustomed ardour to the development of the powers of rifled guns and projectiles, a branch of mechanical science in which he confessedly holds a foremost place, and in perfecting which he is still occupied. End of chapter 14。Chapter 15, Part 1 of Industrial Biography, Ironworkers and Toolmakers by Samuel Smiles. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Clive Catterall. James Naismith By hammer and hand all arts doth stand. Hammermen's motto. The founder of the Scotch family of Naismith is said to have derived his name from the following circumstance. In the course of the feuds which raged for some time between the Scotch kings and their powerful subjects, the Earls of Douglas, a rencontre took place one day on the outskirts of a border village where the king's adherents were worsted. One of them took refuge in the village smithy, where, hastily disguising himself and donning a spare leathern apron, he pretended to be engaged in assisting the smith with his work when a party of the Douglas followers rushed in. They glanced at the pretended workman at the anvil and observed him deliver a blow upon it so unskilfully that the hammer shaft broke in his hand. On this one of the Douglas men rushed at him, calling out, you're a nay, Smith. The assailed man seized his sword, which lay conveniently at hand, and defended himself so vigorously that he shortly killed his assailant, while the smith brained another with his hammer. And a party of the king's men having come to their help, the rest were speedily overpowered. The royal forces then rallied, and their temporary defeat was converted into a victory. The king bestowed a grant of land on his follower, Nay Smith, who assumed for his arms a sword between two hammers with broken shafts, 
and the motto non arte sed marte, as if to disclaim the art of the smith in which he had failed, and to emphasise the superiority of the warrior. Such is said to be the traditional origin of the family of Naismith of Posso in Peeblesshire, who continue to bear the same name and arms. It is remarkable that the inventor of the steam-hammer should have so effectually contradicted the name he bears, and reversed the motto of his family. For so far from being Nay Smith, he may not inappropriately be designated the very Vulcan of the nineteenth century. His hammer is a tool of immense power and pliancy, but for which we must have stopped short in many of those gigantic engineering works which are among the marvels of the age in which we live. It possesses so much precision and delicacy that it will chip the end of an egg resting in a glass on the anvil without breaking it, while it delivers a blow of ten tons with such a force as to be felt shaking the parish. It is therefore with a high degree of appropriateness that Mr. Naismith has discarded the feckless hammer with the broken shafts, and assumed for his emblem his own magnificent steam-hammer at the same time reversing the family motto which he has converted into non marte said arte. James Naismith belongs to a family whose genius in art has long been recognised. His father, Alexander Naismith of Edinburgh, was a landscape painter of great eminence, whose works are sometimes confounded with those of his son Patrick, called the English Hobbema, though his own merits are peculiar and distinctive. The elder Naismith was also an admirable portrait painter, and his head of Burns, the best ever painted of the poet, bears ample witness. His daughters, the Mrs. Naismith, were highly skilled painters of landscape, and their works are well known and much prized. James, the youngest of the family, inherits the same love of art, though his name is more extensively known as a worker and inventor in iron. He was born at Edinburgh on the 19th of August, 1808, and his attention was early directed to mechanics by the circumstance of this being one of his father's hobbies. Besides being an excellent painter, Mr. Naismith had a good general knowledge of architecture and civil engineering, and could work at the lathe and handle tools with the dexterity of a mechanic. He employed nearly the whole of his spare time in a little workshop which adjoined his studio where he encouraged his youngest son to work with him in all sorts of materials. Among his visitors at the studio were Professor Leslie, Patrick Miller of Dolswinton, and other men of distinction. He assisted Mr. Miller in his early experiments with paddle-boats, which eventually led to the invention of the steamboat. It was a great advantage for the boy to be trained by a father who so loved excellence in all its forms, and could minister to his love of mechanics by his own instruction and practice. James used to drink in with pleasure and profit the conversation which passed between his father and his visitors on scientific and mechanical subjects, and as he became older, the resolve grew stronger in him every day that he would be a mechanical engineer and nothing else. At a proper age he was sent to the high school, then as now celebrated for the excellence of its instruction, and there he laid the foundation of a sound and liberal education but he has himself told the simple story of his early life in such graphic terms that we feel we cannot do better than quote his own words. I had the good luck, he says, to have for a school companion the son of an iron founder. Every spare hour I could command was devoted to visits to his father's iron foundry, where I delighted to watch the various processes of moulding, iron melting, casting, forging, pattern making, and other smith and metal work and although I was only about twelve years old at the time, I used to lend a hand in which hearty zeal did a good deal to make up for want of strength. I look back to the Saturday afternoon spent in the workshops of that small foundry as an important part of my education. I did not trust to reading about such and such things. I saw and handled them, and all the ideas in connection with them became permanent in my mind. I also obtained there what was of much value to me in after life, a considerable acquaintance with the nature and character of workmen. By the time I was fifteen I could work and turn out really respectable jobs in wood, brass, iron and steel. Indeed, in the working of the latter inestimable material, I had, at a very early age, eleven or twelve, 
acquired considerable proficiency. As that was the pre-Lucifer match period, the possession of a steel and tinder-box was quite a patent of nobility among boys. So I used to forge old files into steels in my father's little workshop, and harden them, and produce such first-rate neat little articles in that line that I became quite famous among my school companions. And many a task have I excused me by bribing the monitor, whose grim sense of duty never could withstand the glimpse of a steel. My first essay at making a steam engine was when I was fifteen. I then made a real working steam engine, one and three-quarter inches diameter cylinder, and eight inches stroke, which not only could act, but really did some useful work, for I made it grind the oil colours which my father required for his painting. Steam engine models, now so common, were exceedingly scarce in those days, and very difficult to be had and as the demand for them arose, I found it both delightful and profitable to make them, as well as the sectional models of steam engines, which I introduced for the purpose of exhibiting the movements of all the parts, both exterior and interior. With the results of the sale of such models, I was enabled to pay the price of tickets of admission to the lecture on natural philosophy and chemistry, delivered in the University of Edinburgh. About the same time, 1826, I was so happy as to be employed by Professor Leslie in making models and portions of apparatus required by him for his lectures and philosophical investigations, and I also had the inestimable good fortune to secure his friendship. His admirably clear manner of communicating a knowledge of the fundamental principles of mechanical science rendered my intercourse with him of the utmost importance to myself. A hearty, cheerful, earnest desire to toil in his service caused him to take pleasure in instructing me by occasional explanations of what might otherwise have remained obscure. About the years 1827 and 1828, the subject of steam carriages for common roads occupied much of the attention of the public. Many tried to solve the problem. I made a working model of an engine which performed so well that some friends determined to give me the means of making one on a larger scale. This I did and I shall never forget the pleasure and the downright hard work I had in producing, in the autumn of 1828, at an outlay of sixty pounds, a complete steam carriage that ran many a mile with eight persons on it. After keeping it in action two months, to the satisfaction of all who were interested in it, my friends allowed me to dispose of it, and I sold it a great bargain, after which the engine was used in driving a small factory. I may mention that in the engine I employed the waste steam to cause an increased draught by its discharge up the chimney. This important use of the waste steam had been introduced by George Stevenson some years before, though entirely unknown to me. The earnest desire which I cherished of getting forward in the business of life induced me to turn my attention to obtaining employment in some of the great engineering establishments of the day, at the head of which, in my fancy, as well as in reality, stood that of Henry Maudsley of London. It was the summit of my ambition to get work in that establishment. But as my father had not the means of paying a premium, I determined to try what I could do towards attaining my object by submitting to Mr. Maudsley actual specimens of my capability as a young workman and draftsman. To this end I set to work and made a small steam engine, every part of which was the result of my own handiwork including the casting and the forging of the several parts. This I turned out in such style as I should even now be proud of. My sample drawings were, I might say, highly respectable. Armed with such means of obtaining the good opinion of the great Henry Maudsley, on the 19th of May, 1829, I sailed for London in a Leith smack, and after an eight days' voyage saw the metropolis for the first time. I made bold to call on Mr. Maudsley, and told him my simple tale. He desired me to bring my models for him to look at. I did so, and when he came to me, I could see by the expression of his cheerful, well-remembered countenance that I had attained my object. He then and there appointed me to be his own private workman, to assist him in his little paradise of a workshop, furnished with the models of improved machinery and engineering tools of which he had been the great originator. He left me to arrange as to the wages with his chief cashier, 
Mr. Robert Young, and on the first Saturday evening I accordingly went to the counting-house to inquire of him about my pay. He asked me what would satisfy me. Knowing the value of the situation I had obtained, and having a very modest notion of my worthiness to occupy it, I said that if he would not consider ten shillings a week too much, I thought I could do very well with that. I suppose he concluded that I had some means of my own to live on besides the ten shillings a week which I had asked. He little knew that I had determined not to cost my father another farthing when I left home to begin the world on my own account. My proposal was at once acceded to, and well do I remember the pride and delight I felt when I carried to my three shillings a week lodging that night my first wages. Ample they were in my idea, for I knew how little I could live on, and was persuaded that by strict economy I could easily contrive to make the money support me. To help me in this object I contrived a small cooking apparatus, which I forthwith got made by a tinsmith in Lambeth at a cost of six shillings, and by its aid I managed to keep the eating and drinking part of my private account within three shillings and sixpence per week, or four shillings at the outside. I had three meat dinners a week, and generally four rice and milk dinners, all of which were cooked by my little apparatus, which I set in action after breakfast. The oil cost me not quite a halfpenny a day. The meat dinners consisted of a stew of from a half to three quarters of a pound of a leg of beef, the meat costing three and a half pence per pound, which, with sliced potatoes and a little onion, and as much water as just covered all, with a sprinkle of salt and black pepper, by the time I returned to dinner at half-past six, furnished a repast in every respect as good as my appetite. For breakfast I had coffee and a due proportion of quartan loaf. After the first year of my employment under Mr. Maudsley, my wages were raised to fifteen shillings a week, and I then, but not till then, indulged in the luxury of butter to my bread. I am the more particular in all this to show you that I was a thrifty housekeeper, although only a lodger in a three shillings room. I have the old apparatus by me yet, and I shall have another dinner out of it, ere I am a year older, out of regard to days that were full of the real romance of life. On the death of Henry Maudsley in 1831, I passed over to the service of his worthy partner, Mr. Joshua Field, and acted as his draughtsman, much to my advantage, until the end of that year, when I returned to Edinburgh to construct a small stock of engineering tools for the purpose of enabling me to start in business on my own account. This occupied me until the spring of 1833, and during the interval I was accustomed to take in jobs to execute in my little workshop in Edinburgh, so as to obtain the means of completing my stock of tools. In June 1834 I went to Manchester, and took a flat of an old mill in Dale Street, where I began business. In two years my stock had so increased as to overload the floor of the old building to such an extent that the landlord, Mr. Wren, became alarmed, especially as the tenant below me, a glass-cutter, had a visit from the end of a twenty-horse engine-beam one morning among his cut tumblers. To set their anxiety at rest, I went out that evening to Patricroft, and took a look at a rather choice bit of land, bounded on one side by the canal, and on the other by the Liverpool and Manchester Railway. By the end of the week I had secured a lease on the site for 999 years. By the end of the month my woodsheds were erected. The ring of the hammer on the smith's anvil was soon heard all over the place, and the Bridgewater foundry was fairly under way. There I toiled right heartily until December the 31st, 1856, when I retired to enjoy in active leisure the reward of a laborious life, during which, with the blessing of God, I enjoyed much true happiness through the hearty love which I always had for my profession. And I trust I may be allowed to say, without undue vanity, that I have left behind me some useful results of my labours in those inventions with which my name is identified, which have had no small share in the accomplishment of some of the greatest mechanical works of our age. If Mr. Naismith had accomplished nothing more than the invention of his steam-hammer, it would have been enough to found a reputation. Professor Tomlinson described it as one of the most perfect of artificial machines and noblest triumphs of mind over matter that modern English engineers have yet developed. 
The hand hammer has always been an important tool, and in the form of the stone celt it was perhaps the first invented. When the hammer of iron superseded that of stone, it was found practicable in the hands of a cunning workman to execute by its means metalwork of great beauty and even delicacy. But since the invention of cast iron and the manufacture of wrought iron in large masses, the art of hammer-working has almost become lost. And great artists, such as Matzis of Antwerp and Rukas of Nuremberg were, no longer think it worth their while to expend time and skill in working on so humble a material as wrought iron. It is evident from the marks of care and elaborate design which many of these early works exhibit that the workman's heart was in his work, and that his object was not merely to get it out of hand, but to execute it in first-rate artistic style. When the use of iron extended, and larger ironwork came to be forged, for cannon, tools, and machinery, the ordinary hand-hammer was found insufficient, and the helve, or forge-hammer, was invented. This was usually driven by a water-wheel, or by oxen, or horses. The tilt-hammer was another form in which it was used, the smaller kinds being worked by the foot. Among Watt's various inventions was a tilt-hammer of considerable power, which he first worked by means of a water-wheel, and afterwards by a steam-engine regulated by a fly-wheel. His first hammer of this kind was a hundred and twenty pounds in weight. It was raised eight inches before making each blow. Watt afterwards made a tilt-hammer for Mr. Wilkinson of Bradley Forge of seven and a half hundred weight, and it made three hundred blows a minute. Other improvements were made in the hammer from time to time, but no material alteration was made in the power by which it was worked until Mr. Naismith took it in hand, and applying to it the force of steam at once provided the worker in iron with the most formidable of machine tools. This important invention originated as follows. In the early part of 1837, the directors of the Great Western Steamship Company sent Mr. Francis Humphreys, their engineer, to consult Mr. Naismith as to some engineering tools of unusual size and power, which were required for the construction of the engines of the Great Britain steamship. They had determined to construct those engines on the vertical trunk engine principle, in accordance with Mr. Humphreys' designs, and very complete works were erected by them at their Bristol dockyard for the execution of the requisite machinery the most important of the tools being supplied by Naismith and Gaskell. The engines were in hand when a difficulty arose with respect to the enormous paddle-shaft of the vessel, which was of such a size of forging as had never before been executed. Mr. Humphreys applied to the largest engineering firms throughout the country for tenders on the price at which they would execute this part of work. But to his surprise and dismay he found that not one of the firms he applied to would undertake so large a forging. In this dilemma he wrote to Mr. Naismith on the 24th of November, 1838, informing him of this unlooked-for difficulty. "'I find,' said he, "'there is not a forge-hammer in England or Scotland powerful enough to forge the paddle-shaft of the engines for the Great Britain. What am I to do? Do you think I might dare use cast-iron?' This letter immediately set Mr. Naismith a-thinking. "'How was it?' that existing hammers were incapable of forging a wrought-iron shaft of thirty inches diameter. Simply because of their want of compass, or range and fall as well as power of blow. A few moments' rapid thought satisfied him that it was by rigidly adhering to the old traditional form of hand-hammer, of which the tilt, though driven by steam, was only but a modification, that the difficulty had arisen. When even the largest hammer was tilted up to its full height, its range was so small that when a piece of work of considerable size was placed on the anvil, the hammer became gagged, and on such an occasion, when the forging required the most powerful blow, it received next to no blow at all, the clear space for fall being almost entirely occupied by the work on the anvil. The obvious remedy was to invent some method by which a block of iron should be lifted to a sufficient height above the object on which it was desired to strike a blow, and let the block fall down upon the work, guiding it in its descent by such simple means as should give the required precision in the percussive action of the falling mass. 
Following out this idea, Mr. Naismith at once sketched on paper his steam hammer. Having it clearly before him in his mind's eye, a few minutes after receiving Mr. Humphrey's letter, narrating his unlooked-for difficulty. The hammer, as thus sketched, consisted of first an anvil on which to rest the work, second a block of iron constituting the hammer or blow-giving part, third an inverted steam cylinder to whose piston-rod the block was attached. All that was then required to produce by such means a most effective hammer was simply to admit steam in the cylinder so as to act on the underside of the piston, and so raise the block attached to the piston-rod, and by a simple contrivance to let the steam escape, and so permit the block rapidly to descend by its own gravity upon the work on the anvil. Such, in a few words, is the rationale of the steam-hammer. By the same day's post Mr. Naismith wrote to Mr. Humphreys, enclosing a sketch of the invention by which he proposed to forge the Great Britain paddle-shaft. Mr. Humphreys showed it to Mr. Brunel, the engineer-in-chief of the company, to Mr. Guppy, the managing director, and to others interested in the undertaking by all of whom it was heartily approved. Mr. Naismith gave permission to communicate his plans to such forge proprietors as might feel disposed to erect such a hammer to execute the proposed work, the only condition which he made being that, in the event of the hammer being adopted, he was to be allowed to supply it according to his own design. The paddle-shaft of the Great Britain was, however, never forged. About that time the substitution of the screw for the paddle-wheel as a means of propulsion of steam-vessels was attracting much attention, and the performances of the Archimedes were so successful as to induce Mr. Brunel to recommend his directors to adopt the new power. They yielded to his entreaty. The great engines which Mr. Humphreys had designed were accordingly set aside, and he was required to produce fresh designs of engines suited for screw propulsion. The result was fatal to Mr. Humphreys. The labour, the anxiety, and perhaps the disappointment, proved too much for him, and a brain fever carried him off, so that neither his great paddle-shaft nor Mr. Naismith's steam-hammer to forge it was any longer needed. End of chapter 15, part 1《Chapter 15, Part 2 of Industrial Biography — Iron Workers and Toolmakers by Samuel Smiles — This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Clive Catterall — James Naismith, Part 2 The hammer was left to bide its time. No forge-master would take it up. The inventor wrote to all the great firms urging its superiority to every other tool for working malleable iron into all kinds of forge-work. Thus he wrote and sent illustrative sketches of his hammer to Ackermans and Morgan of Bristol, to the late Benjamin Hick and Rushton and Eckersley of Bolton, to Howard and Ravenhill of Rotherhithe and other firms. But unhappily bad times for the iron trade had set in, and although all to whom he communicated his design were much struck by its simplicity and obvious advantages, the answer usually given was, We have not orders enough to keep in work the forge hammers we already have, and we do not desire at present to add any new ones, however improved. At that time no patent had been taken out for the invention. Mr. Naismith had not yet saved money enough to enable him to do so on his own account, and his partner declined to spend money upon a tool that no engineer would give the firm an order for. No secret was made of the invention and excepting to its owner, it did not seem to be worth one farthing. Such was the unpromising state of affairs when M. Schneider of the Crusoe Ironworks in France called at the Patricroft Works, together with his practical mechanic, M. Bourdon, for the purpose of ordering some tools of the firm. Mr. Naismith was absent on a journey at the time, but his partner, Mr. Gaskell, as an act of courtesy to the strangers, took the opportunity of showing them all that was new and interesting in regard to mechanism about the works. And among other things, Mr. Gaskill brought out his partner's sketch or scheme-book, which lay in a drawer in the office, and showed them the design of the steam-hammer, which no English firm would adopt. 
they were much struck with its simplicity and practical utility, and M. Bourdon took careful note of its arrangements. Mr. Naismith, on his return, was informed of a visit of Messrs. Schneider and Bourdon, for the circumstance of their having inspected the design of his steam-hammer seems to have been regarded by his partner as too trivial a matter to be repeated to him, and he knew nothing of the circumstance until his visit to France in April 1840. When passing through the works at Crusoe with M. Bourdon, Mr. Naismith saw a crankshaft of unusual size, not only forged in the piece, but punched. He immediately asked, "'How did you forge that shaft?' M. Bourdon's answer was, "'Why, with your hammer, to be sure!' Great indeed was Naismith's surprise, for he had never yet seen the hammer except in his own drawing. A little explanation soon cleared all up. M. Bourdon said he had been so much struck with the ingenuity and simplicity of the arrangement that he had no sooner returned than he had set to work, and had a hammer made in general accordance with the design Mr. Gaskell had shown him and that its performance had answered his every expectation. He then took Mr. Naismith to see the steam-hammer, and great was his delight at seeing the child of his brain in full and active work. It was not, according to Mr. Naismith's idea, quite perfect, and he readily suggested several improvements, conformable with the original design, which M. Bourdon forthwith adopted. On reaching England, Mr. Naismith at once wrote to his partner, telling him what he had seen, and urging that the taking out of a patent for the protection of the invention ought no longer to be deferred. But trade was still very much depressed, and, as the Patricroft firm needed all their capital to carry on their business, Mr. Gaskell objected to lock up any of it in engineering novelties. Seeing himself on the brink of losing his property in the invention, Mr. Naismith applied to his brother-in-law, William Bennett, Esquire, who advanced him the requisite money for the purpose, about two hundred and eighty pounds, and the patent was secured in June 1840. The first hammer of thirty hundredweight was made for the Patricroft works, with the consent of the partners, and in the course of a few weeks it was in full work. The precision and beauty of its action, the perfect ease with which it was managed, and the untiring force of its percussive blows, were the admiration of all who saw it and from that moment the steam-hammer became a recognised power in modern mechanics. The variety or gradation of its blows was such that it was found practicable to manipulate a hammer of ten tons as easily as if it had only been of ten ounces weight. It was under such complete control that while descending with its greatest momentum it could be arrested at any point with even greater ease than any instrument used by hand. While capable of forging an armstrong hundred-pounder or the sheet anchor for a ship of the line, it could hammer a nail, or crack a nut without bruising the kernel. When it came into general use, the facilities which it afforded for executing all kinds of forging had the effect of greatly increasing the quantity of work done, at the same time that expense was saved. The cost of making anchors was reduced by at least fifty per cent, while the quality of the forging was improved. Before its invention, the manufacture of a shaft of fifteen or twenty hundredweight required the concentrated exertions of a large establishment, and its successful execution was regarded as a great triumph of skill, whereas forgings of twenty or thirty tons weight are now things of almost everyday occurrence. Its advantages were so obvious that its adoption soon became general, and in the course of a few years Naismith steam hammers were to be found in every well-appointed workshop both at home and abroad. Many modifications have been made in the tool by Condy, Morrison, Naylor, Rigby, and others, but Naismith's was the father of them all, and still holds its ground. Among the important uses to which this hammer has of late been applied is the manufacture of iron plates for covering the ships of war, and the fabrication of the immense wrought-iron ordnance of Armstrong, Whitworth, and Blakely. But for the steam-hammer, indeed, it is doubtful whether such weapons could have been made. It is also used for the remanufacture of iron in various other forms, to say nothing of the greatly extended use which it has been the direct means of effecting in wrought iron and steel forgings in every description of machinery, from the largest marine steam-engines to the most nice and delicate parts of textile mechanism. <laughs> 
"'It is not too much to say,' observes a writer in The Engineer, "'that without Naismith's steam-hammer we must have stopped short in many of those gigantic engineering works which, but for the decay of all wonder in us, would be the perpetual wonder of this age, and which have enabled our modern engineers to take rank above the gods of all mythologies. There is one use to which the steam-hammer is now becoming extensively applied by some of our manufacturers that deserves especial mention, rather for the prospect which it opens to us than for what has already actually been accomplished. We allude to the manufacture of large articles in dyes, and one manufactory in the country, railway wheels, for example, are being manufactured with enormous economy by this means. The various parts of the wheels are produced in quantity, either by rolling or by dies under the hammer. These parts are brought together in their relative positions in a mould, heated to a welding heat, and then by a blow of the steam hammer furnished with dies, are stamped into a complete and all but finished wheel. It is evident that wherever wrought-iron articles of a manageable size have to be produced in considerable quantities, the same process may be adopted, and the saving effected by the substitution of this for the ordinary forging process will doubtless, ere long, prove incalculable. For this, as for the many other advantageous uses of the steam-hammer, we are primarily and mainly indebted to Mr. Naismith. It is right, therefore, that we should hold his name in honour. In fact, when we think of the universal service which this machine is rendering us, we feel that some special expression of our indebtedness to him would be a reasonable and grateful service. The benefit which he has conferred upon us is so great as to justly entitle him to stand side by side with the few men who have gained name and fame as great inventive engineers, and to whom we have testified our gratitude, usually unhappily, when it was too late for them to enjoy it. Mr. Naismith subsequently applied the principle of the steam-hammer in the pile-driver, which he invented in 1845. Until its production all piles had been driven by means of a small mass of iron falling upon the head of the pile with great velocity from a considerable height, the raising of the iron mass by means of the monkey being an operation that occupied much time and labour, with which the results were very incommensurate. Pile-driving was, in Mr. Naismith's words, conducted on the artillery or cannon-ball principle, the action being excessive and the mass deficient, and adapted rather for destructive than impulsive action. In his new and beautiful machine he applied the elastic force of steam in raising the ram or driving block, on which, the block being disengaged, its whole weight of three tons descended on the head of the pile the process being repeated eighty times in a minute. The pile was sent home with a rapidity that was quite marvellous compared with the old-fashioned system. In forming coffer-dams for the piers and abutments of bridges, quays and harbours, and in piling the foundations of all kinds of masonry, the steam pile-driver was found of invaluable use by the engineer. At the first experiment made with the machine, Mr. Naismith drove a fourteen-inch pile fifteen feet into hard ground at a rate of sixty-five blows a minute. The driver was first used in forming the great steam-dock at Davenport, where the results were very striking. It was shortly after employed by Robert Stevenson in piling the foundations of the great high-level bridge at Newcastle, and the border bridge at Berwick, as well as in several other of his great works. The saving of time effected by this machine was very remarkable, the rate being one to one thousand eight hundred. That is, a pile could be driven in four minutes that before required twelve hours. One of the peculiar features of the invention was that of employing the pile itself as the support of the steam-hammer part of the apparatus while it was being driven, so that the pile had the percussive action of the dead weight of the hammer as well as its lively blows to induce it to sink into the ground. The steam-hammer sat, as it were, on the shoulders of the pile, while it dealt forth its ponderous blows on the pile head at the rate of eighty a minute, and as the pile sank, the hammer followed it down with never relaxing activity until it was driven home to the required depth. One of the most ingenious contrivances employed in the driver, which was also adopted in the hammer, was the use of steam as a buffer in the upper part of the cylinder, which had the effect of a recoil spring 
and greatly enhanced the force of the downward blow. In 1846, Mr. Naismith designed a form of steam engine after that of his steam hammer, which has been extensively adopted all over the world for screw ships of all size. The pyramidal form of the engine, and its great simplicity and get-at ability of parts, together with the circumstance that all the weighty parts of the engine are kept low, have rendered it a universal favourite. Among the other labour-saving tools invented by Mr. Naismith, may be mentioned the well-known planing machine for small work, called Naismith's Steam Arm, now used in every large workshop. It was contrived for the purpose of executing a large order for locomotives received from the Great Western Railway, and was found of great use in accelerating the work, especially in planing the links, levers, connecting rods, and smaller kinds of wrought iron work in those engines. His circular cutter for toothed wheels was another of his handy inventions, which shortly came into general use. In iron founding also he introduced a valuable practical improvement. The old mode of pouring the molten metal into the moulds was by means of a large ladle with one or two cross-handles and levers, but many dreadful accidents occurred through a slip of the hand, and Mr. Naismith resolved, if possible, to prevent them. The plan he adopted was to fix a worm-wheel on the side of the ladle, into which a worm was geared, and by this simple contrivance one man was enabled to move the largest ladle on its axis with perfect ease and safety. By this means the work was more promptly performed, and accidents entirely avoided. Mr. Naismith's skill in invention was backed by great energy and a large fund of common sense, qualities not often found united. These proved of much service to the concern of which he was the head, indeed constituted the vital force. The firm prospered as it deserved, and they executed orders not only for England, but for most countries in the civilised world. Mr. Naismith had the advantage of being trained in a good school, that of Henry Maudsley, where he had not only learnt handicraft under the eye of that great mechanic, but the art of organising labour, and, what is of great value to an employer, knowledge of the character of workmen. Yet the Naismith firm were not without their troubles as respected the mechanics in their employment, and on one occasion they had to pass through the ordeal of a very formidable strike. The manner in which the inventor of the steam-hammer literally scotched this strike was very characteristic. A clever young man, employed by the firm as a brass founder, being found to have a peculiar capacity for skilled mechanical work, had been advanced to the lathe. The other men objected to his being so employed, on the ground that it was against the rules of the trade. "'But he is a first-rate workman,' replied the employers, "'and we think it right to advance a man according to his conduct and his merits.' "'No matter,' said the workman. "'It is against the rules, and if you do not take the man from the lathe, we must turn out.' "'Very well. We hold to our right of selecting the best men for the best places, and we will not take the man from the lathe. The consequence was a general turnout. Pickets were set about the works, and any stray men who went thither to seek employment were waylaid, and if not induced to turn back, were maltreated or annoyed until they were glad to leave. The works were almost at a standstill. This state of things could not be allowed to go on, and the head of the firm bestirred himself accordingly with his usual energy. He went down to Scotland, searched all the best mechanical workshops there, and after a time succeeded in engaging sixty-four good hands. He forbade them coming by driblets, but held them together until there was a full freight, and then they came, with their wives, families, chests of drawers and eight-day clocks, in a steamboat specially hired for their transport from Greenock to Liverpool. From thence they came by special train to Patricroft, where houses were in readiness for their reception. The arrival of so numerous, well-dressed and respectable a corps of workmen and their families was an event in the neighbourhood, and could not fail to strike the pickets with surprise. Next morning the sixty-four Scotchmen assembled in the yard at Patricroft, and after giving three cheers went quietly to their work. The picketing went on for a little while longer, but it was of no use against a body of strong men who stood shoulder to shoulder. 
as the new hands did. It was even bruited about that there were more trains to follow. It very soon became clear that the back of the strike was broken. The men returned to their work, and the clever brass founder continued at his turning lathe, from which he speedily rose to still higher employment. Notwithstanding the losses and suffering occasioned by strikes, Mr. Naismith holds the opinion that they have, on the whole, produced much more good than evil. They have served to stimulate invention in an extraordinary degree. Some of the most important labour-saving processes now in common use are directly traceable to them. In the case of many of our most potent self-acting tools and machines, manufacturers could not be induced to adopt them until compelled to do so by strikes. This was the case with the self-acting mule, the wool-combing machine, the planing machine, the slotting machine, Naismith's steam arm, and many others. Thus, even in the mechanical world, they may be a soul of goodness in things evil. Mr. Naismith retired from business in December 1856. He had the moral courage to come out of the groove which he had so laboriously made for himself, and to leave a large and prosperous business, saying, I have now enough of this world's goods. Let younger men have their chance. He settled down at his rural retreat in Kent, but not to lead a life of idle ease. Industry had become his habit, and active occupation was necessary to his happiness. He fell back upon the cultivation of those artistic tastes which are the heritage of his family. When a boy at the high school of Edinburgh, he was so skilful in making pen and ink illustrations on the margins of the classics, that he thus often purchased from his monitors exemptions from the lessons of the day. Nor had he ceased to cultivate the art during his residence at Patricroft, but was accustomed to fall back upon it for relaxation and enjoyment amid the pursuits of the trade. That he possesses remarkable fertility of imagination, and great skill in architectural and landscape drawing, as well as in the much more difficult art of delineating the human figure, will be obvious to anyone who has seen his works, more particularly his City of St. Anne's, The Fairies, and Everybody Forever, which last was exhibited in Pall Mall, among the recent collections of works of art by amateurs and others for the relief of the Lancashire distress. He has also brought his common sense to bear on such unlikely subjects as the origin of the cuneiform character. The possession of a brick from Babylon set him thinking. How had it been manufactured? Its underside was clearly marked by the sedges of the Euphrates, upon which it had been laid to dry and bake in the sun. But how about those curious cuneiform characters? How had writing assumed so remarkable a form? His surmise was this, that the brickmakers, in telling their tale of bricks, used the triangular corner of another brick and by pressing it down upon the soft clay, left behind it the triangular mark which the cuneiform character exhibits. Such marks repeated, and placed in different relations to each other, would readily represent any number. From the use of the corner of a brick in writing, the transition was easy to a pointed stick with a triangular end, by the use of which all the cuneiform characters can readily be produced upon the soft clay. This curious question formed the subject of an interesting paper read by Mr. Naismith before the British Association at Cheltenham. But the most engrossing of Mr. Naismith's later pursuits has been the science of astronomy, in which, by bringing a fresh original mind to the observation of celestial phenomena, he has succeeded in making some of the most remarkable discoveries of our time. Astronomy was one of his favourite pursuits at Patricroft and on his retirement became his serious study. By repeated observations with a powerful reflecting telescope of his own construction, he succeeded in making a very careful and minute painting of the craters, cracks, mountains and valleys of the moon's surface, for which a council medal was awarded him at the Great Exhibition of 1851. But the most striking discovery which he has made by means of a big telescope the result of patient, continuous, and energetic observation, has been that of the nature of the sun's surface, and the character of the extraordinary light-giving bodies, apparently possessed of voluntary action, moving across it. 
sometimes forming spots or hollows of more than a hundred thousand miles in diameter. The results of these observations were of so novel a character that astronomers for some time hesitated to receive them as facts. Yet so eminent an astronomer as Sir John Herschel does not hesitate now to describe them as a most wonderful discovery. According to Mr. Naismith's observations, says he, made with a very fine telescope of his own making, the bright surface of the sun consists of separate, insulated, individual objects or things, all nearly or exactly of one certain definite size and shape, which is more like that of a willow leaf, as he describes them, than anything else. These leaves or scales are not arranged in any order, as those on a butterfly's wing are, but lie crossing one another in all directions, like what are called spills in the game of spillikins, except at the borders of a spot, where they point for the most part inwards towards the middle of the spot, presenting much the sort of appearance that the small leaves of some water-plants or seaweeds do at the edge of a deep hole of clear water. The exceedingly definite shape of these objects, their exact similarity to one another, and the way in which they lie across and athwart each other, except where they form a sort of bridge across a spot, in which case they seem to affect a common direction, namely that of the bridge itself. All these characters seem quite repugnant to the notion of their being of vaporous or cloudy or a fluid nature. Nothing remains but to consider them as separate and independent sheets, flakes or scales, having some sort of solidity. And these flakes, be they what they may, and whatever may be said about the dashing of meteoric stones into the sun's atmosphere, etc., are evidently the immediate source of the solar light and heat, by whatever mechanism or whatever processes they may be enabled to develop and, as it were, elaborate these elements from the bosom of the non-luminous fluid in which they appear to float. Looked at in this point of view, we cannot refuse to regard them as organisms of some peculiar and amazing kind and though it would be too daring to speak of such organization as partaking of the nature of life, yet we do know that vital action is competent to develop heat and light, as well as electricity. These wonderful objects have been seen by others, as well as Mr. Naismith, so that there is no room for doubt of their reality. Such is the marvellous discovery made by the inventor of the steam-hammer, as described by the most distinguished astronomer of the age. A writer in the Edinburgh Review, referring to the subject in a recent number, says it shows him to possess an intellect as profound as it is expert. Doubtless his training as a mechanic, his habits of close observation, and his ready inventiveness, which conferred so much power on him as an engineer, proved of equal advantage to him when labouring in the domain of physical science, bringing a fresh mind of keen perception to his new studies, and uninfluenced by preconceived opinions he saw them in new and original lights, and hence the extraordinary discovery above described by Sir John Herschel. Some two hundred years since, a member of the Naismith family, Jean Naismith of Hamilton, was burnt for a witch, one of the last martyrs to ignorance and superstition in Scotland, because she read her Bible with two pairs of spectacles. Had Mr. Naismith lived then, he might, with his two telescopes of his own making, which bring the sun and moon into his chamber for him to examine and paint, have been taken for a sorcerer. But fortunately for him, and still more so for us, Mr. Naismith stands before the public of this age as not only one of its ablest mechanics, but as one of the most accomplished and original of scientific observers. End of chapter 15